What a travesty. All that work, all those images I thought I got, and look, nothing. Blank Rose of Film. Way to start 2022. Yo, what's going on? Welcome back to the channel. Just got back from vacation and I got a whole bunch of pictures to show you from my trip to Abisko, Sweden. That's basically in the Arctic Circle, all the way at the northernmost part of Sweden. And what you get out there is what you expect in the Arctic Circle. A lot of cold, a lot of snow, and very, very little light in the wintertime. But there's some really cute things about it. One of the things specifically is the fact that given the low light, you get these incredible sunset and sunrises that you know last for a good two, three hours since the sun kind of just hangs out around the horizon. And you get these dramatic kind of situations with beautiful clouds and texture and color and all that. So you can see a whole bunch of that in this video. And of course, I did a whole bunch of cool activities that showcase a lot of interesting things and also some beautiful landscapes. So let's go ahead and go to the beginning here. Wanna hop on the train to go up north. So this train ride was actually an overnight sleeper car. Basically, it's about a 14, 15 hour ride from Stockholm, Sweden, all the way up north to Abisko. And it's a sleeper car. So, you know, you get in there and you kind of relax, drink a couple beers, eat some snacks, and then you sleep. And when I say sleep, I don't mean glamorous sleep, but it's definitely better than the sleep you get on an airplane. Here is our ladder. We're going up and down on our beds. As you can see, bed one, top bunk. The seat belt. Yeah, because your seat belt. Oh, it's not the worst. Yeah. Here is bed two. Down here. Fold down, and this is the green. Bucket. Hold on, show bed two. Here, pull this right here. Oh, you gotta unlock it. All right, well, maybe we won't do it now then. Oh, there you go. Here's bed two. Yep. Here's bed three. Bed three. I think the shortest person might be in this one. That's you? I don't know, we'll see. All right, that wraps the tour. Yeah, but you forgot to show the sink. Oh, sorry, yeah, our jail sink. This is, this is where you can smuggle things. And you can drink some water. That's where you can hide your drugs. Okay. Thanks for coming to our tour. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, we actually didn't even make it all the way up to Abisko on this train. Basically, they kicked us off the train about, let's say, an hour and a half or so before we were supposed to get to Abisko. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but instead of that one and a half hours that was left on the train, we then had to replace that with a bus. And it was about a four and a half hour bus ride all the way to Kiruna, which is then basically where we pick up our rental car and then drive another hour and change to Abisko. So it's a whole day of a journey, basically. Um, not ideal, but you know, you do what you gotta do to get to the cool places. Representative Peter. Yeah, baby. <laughs> The S. So we got to Abisko pretty late and there really wasn't much left to do that night. So, you know, we packed it in, got some good night's sleep and then got ready for tomorrow's activity, which was dog sledding. I had no idea what to expect with dog sledding since I had never done it, but it was pretty cool. We featured some Alaskan Husky dogs and they're actually not giant dogs. They're, they're kind of small-ish, they're very fit and a whole pack of them can pull a whole lot of weight. So this is pretty interesting. And honestly, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Remember those sunrises and sunsets that I mentioned? Well, we got our first epic one on this day, and it was actually during the dog sledding itself. So as I was riding in the dog sled, I think I was number two in the kind of line. My wife was at the front as number one. I'd basically take my film camera and reach out in front of her and just start snapping away. And it worked, you know, I got some pretty cool pictures and you can see some incredible colors here captured on the Kodak Portrait 800. After the dog sledding, we got treated to a nice kind of tea and cinnamon bun session inside of a, you know, kind of like a tent, TP looking thing. I'm not really sure what the official term is, but it was warm in there and there was a fire as well. So it was nice to go in there after spending all the time outside dog sledding where there's all this wind and, you know, the snow and the elements hitting you all at once. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I like it. How many 
All right, so that same night, based off of the website that they have locally where you can see the activity in the Aurora, I decided, you know what? This is a perfect time for us to go out. Now, I was actually gonna go to sleep. Let's say it was around 12 a.m. or something like that, but based off of the website, I felt pretty good and I figured, you know what? If I don't do this right now, I'm gonna regret it. So I put on all my gear. I got my wife and a couple of the other two people in the group and we headed out. And we hiked up to an overlook that's, let's say, 20 minutes from where we were staying and it was incredible. Best decision I made hands down in you know, all of recent time, honestly. I was gonna pack it in and go to sleep, but instead I grabbed my cameras and I headed up to the overlook and it was totally worth it. Oh shit, yeah, this is good. I see a lot from here. You can see here some really kind of crappy camera footage, but basically I put my mirrorless camera at about one eighth of a second at ISO who knows what, and I tried to record the Aurora live. And you can see it here. This is video footage of the Aurora. I'd say out of, you know, zero to 10, this particular showing was maybe like a three or something like that, um, which is good enough to do photography because the camera is very sensitive to that green color. But with your own eyes, you can basically just see, you know, light. You can see a bit of a bright spot in the sky that kind of changed and morphed a little bit. It wasn't green to the naked eye. If this was, let's say a seven, eight or nine out of 10, then you probably would get that strong color. You'd be able to see what you see in the photos with your own eyes. I've never experienced that myself. And even when I went to Iceland a few years ago, I didn't see it like that either. But, you know, based off of talking to a bunch of people, that actually does happen. You just have to be in the right place at the right time. And unfortunately for me, you know, it wasn't that strong, but it was still pretty cool. And I managed to get some cool photos here. So here's a bunch of digital photos that I got. I obviously brought my digital camera as well because I knew that this was gonna be challenging potentially and I wanted to make sure I got something good. So I'll show you some digitals first and then we'll talk about films. So I was using my Canon P to get some film shots and I pulled this out after I had already gotten my digital shots because I knew I wanted to kind of test the waters with digital, make sure I knew what I was doing and make sure I could actually get what I wanted. And then I jumped into the film shots. And with the film shots, I basically estimated my exposures based off of this chart that I found. Basically, this chart was created by this guy who lived in Alaska. I don't know if he's still alive. It'd be interesting to talk to him, honestly. But ultimately, he lived in Alaska and the Northern Lights were basically just part of his day to day. So he was always photographing them on film. And he used a whole bunch of different film stocks, 200, 400, 800. He wasn't shooting like 3,200 or 1,600 for the most part. It was pretty cool to see that he could get such amazing photos with all these different film stocks back in the day. So I used his chart and basically shooting Kodak Portrait 800 um, on a 35 millimeter 2.8 lens. I could probably do, let's say anywhere between eight to 15 seconds of exposure and that would give me a good photo. Uh, it didn't quite work out for me, but I think I was actually doing something wrong because um, I realized at one point that my camera was not on bulb, which I thought I had it on. It was on this X mode. I don't know what that is on the Canon P, but that's what I had it on. And when I realized that was the case, I then realized I probably had screwed up you know, 10 or so photos that I had taken up to that moment. So when I switched it to bulb mode and then did some proper exposures, I actually got some results that looked like something. Uh, they're not incredible, especially when you compare them to the digital files, but um, it's interesting. It's kind of nice. And on my way back to go to sleep, on the way back down from the hike, I actually noticed that you could see the lights from the main area where we were staying, where all the cabins were. So I decided, you know what, let me pull out my camera one last time. Let's use the film camera this time and let's see what images I could create. And honestly, this was the best single image that I made on film of the Northern Lights. Check it out. So the next day we actually headed to the famous ice hotel. And this is basically a hotel where uh, they take these giant blocks of ice that are local from frozen lakes and things like that and they build a crazy structure and it's not just a structure it really is like a full standing building and people stay in these rooms i don't know how they do it because it was cold in there i don't care what you say it is definitely cold you can't sleep naked in there you can't sleep in regular clothes you basically got to sleep with a coat on and a scarf and all this other stuff but do pay a whole lot of money to stay there and that's good for them i would never do that but it was nice to go and actually check out the building itself and the building was great. I shot some EZ400 here, which is kind of tough because it was very dark in here. But, you know, rated at 400, you get some interesting, you know, just barely usable results. If I went back and did it again, I'd probably use something a bit more sensitive for, you know, lower light. But still pretty cool nonetheless. All right.
right, so on one of the last days that we were there, we actually went down to a frozen lake. And there's a bunch of lakes, because you know, Northern Sweden is a bit of a mountainous region, so you have a lot of lakes all over the place. And they're very beautiful. Apparently the lake that was local to Abisko had just frozen, maybe the week earlier. So I was a bit, you know, not the most excited about walking on the frozen lake because, you know, you get all these terrible thoughts in your head, but it turned out that this was more than frozen enough and you could go on and walk as long as you wanted. So we, that's exactly what we did. We hiked down this pretty steep snowy hill that was a lot of fun to get down without busting your whole ass. But once you get down to the lake, it was incredible. I mean, check out these views. We did this hike right around the time when the sun was starting to quote unquote set. Um, and that was a fantastic decision because look at the colors that we got in the sky. It was just wild. I popped off so many shots here and it was amazing. If you ever find a situation where you don't have hiking poles but you do have a camera tripod just know that the camera tripod works pretty well for you know as a hiking pole it's not definitely ideal and it's not what you're supposed to be doing but i did it and it helped me get my ass all the way back up that snowy slippery hill um, so you know write that one down for future use Remember that footage I showed at the beginning of the video with blank rolls of medium format film? This is where it hurts the most. I actually used a couple different film stocks in my Mamiya C330, loaded them as I usually do, did everything as I normally did, except for this time I was using a cable release. Not that that should really make a difference. Ultimately, I thought I was shooting images the entire time and I got not one single image on either two of the rolls that I shot. Everything was 100% blank. And I know this was, you know, user error, aka my fault, and not some sort of developing problem because same chemicals I used to develop all the other images you saw in here, color images, same exact chemicals that I used to develop this. So something was wrong with the camera or I did something wrong when operating it. And basically the shutter either wasn't opening, it was firing at too fast of a speed and therefore not registering anything. I have no idea, but literally the rolls of film are 100% blank, not even a faint image on anything. And it sucks because, you know, look at the beautiful scene that I was trying to capture in this particular session right here. Woke up early to do this too. So yeah, it's a huge shame that my Mamiya C330 didn't do what I wanted it to do. But of course, I always have a backup camera. And that's very important because you can then kind of duplicate the shots that you're doing on medium format on 35 millimeter. And that's exactly what I did. So here's some images from the exact kind of scene that you just saw, except with my 35 millimeter Canon camera. A couple things that I learned while on this trip with regards to film photography. Number one is if you're going somewhere that's very cold, bring cameras that you're extremely comfortable with and that make it easy for you to shoot because, you know, when your fingers are frozen and the wind's howling and, you know, it's cold outside, the last thing you want to do is fiddle with the camera that you don't know how to use very well. It's just not going to work out for you. Other thing I highly recommend is bringing backup cameras because you have no idea what could happen out there. So, you know, bring something bare bones that is gonna get you an image, you know, like a point and shoot or something like that. You know, it might not sound glamorous or anything like that, but it's gonna save you from having completely blank rolls like I did on medium format, and then I have anything. Fortunately, I did have my backup, and that made a humongous difference for me. Last thing is, if you're gonna photograph the Northern Lights, you don't need, you know, all this crazy high ISO film. I think, honestly, the most important thing is the lens. If you've got a lens that, you know, has a very wide aperture, let's say f1.4 or even 1.2, that's gonna make much bigger of a difference than having higher ISO film. Obviously, higher ISO film can help, you know, like, let's say, like a Portra 800 like I had, but ultimately, the lens is what matters. Make sure you know where the infinity point is for those lenses, because in the dark, it's gonna be very hard to see. And yeah, then you should be good to go. I would love to try this again because I feel like my film images weren't that great, but that last image that I took gives me a whole lot of hope because it looks good. So, you know, one day maybe I'll go see the Southern Lights or whatever those are called, the Aurora something something. All right, y'all, that's what I got for today. That was a fun trip and I'm glad to share with you my experiences because I shot a whole bunch of film 
and it was a lot of fun. If you enjoyed the video, of course, go like, share, do all that stuff. And that's it. Until the next video, y'all, I'm out.